2023 was a pretty big year for us. We managed to do a lot of things we've been wanting to do for a very long time and managed to make a lot of videos that I am just so proud of. I know I'm a little bit late here, but I just want to take a moment to look back at some of our best videos over the last year. Some of the ones I personally think back on as more than just YouTube videos, but instructive experiences that expanded my view of the world and made me more creative in the process. A big thanks to our sponsor Brilliant for giving us the chance to share this hour and a half of sponsor-free content. By sponsoring this one big video, they've basically let us share our five best videos from the last year without any pauses or breaks for the usual sponsor reads, which should be a really nice experience. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy our five best videos from 2023. Somewhere out there among the stars, very, very far from Earth, there shines a dim celestial object of little consequence. Astronomers call it Asteroid B612, just another twinkle in the night sky. What astronomers can't see through their telescopes, and would hardly believe if they did, is that this asteroid is inhabited. Here on this chunk of rock, scarcely bigger than a house, lives a little prince. He doesn't own much, one can hardly have much on a planet this size, but for him, it is enough. Every morning, he heats his breakfast over one of his three knee-height volcanoes, sweeps them out to keep them tidy, weeds out the pesky baobabs that sprout like weeds across the planet, and sits in his chair to watch the sunset. Life at home is quiet, solitary, and peaceful. That is, until the arrival of someone new. A special, mysterious seed carried by the wind from who knows where. It roots itself on his asteroid and, under the little prince's watchful eye, begins to grow. And then, one morning, right at the moment of sunrise, it finally unfurls its petals and, yawning daintily, reveals itself to be a lovely, vain, and fatal rose. Our story begins not with the little prince on his little planet so very far away. It begins right here, on Earth, with another little boy who wanted to make art. The first piece he ever created looked like this. When he showed it to the grown-ups, he asked whether it frightened them. But far from afraid, they were simply confused. Why should we be frightened by a hat? They asked. No one could see his masterpiece for what it so obviously was. A picture of a mighty boa constrictor in the primeval forest, digesting an elephant which it had just swallowed whole. Grown-ups can be surprisingly unperceptive sometimes. They advised him to put aside such silly doodles and focus on important things, arithmetic, grammar, geography, and such. And so, at the age of six, he put away his crayons. But, over the course of the years, as he slowly grew from a child into a grown-up himself, he would still pull out his drawing from time to time when he met someone who seemed clear-sighted and show it to them. This? This is a hat, they would inevitably say. He never met anyone who saw like him. Not, at least, until he met the little prince. Our little artist has since grown up to be a pilot, and on one of his journeys, his engine gives out, and he finds himself stranded in the Sahara Desert. Isolated and exhausted, he goes to sleep that night beside the wreckage of his plane, but the surprise of hearing an odd little voice speaking above him soon shocks him to his feet. If you please, draw me a sheep, a boy with golden hair requests. The pilot blinks, trying to recover from the astonishment of seeing that he was not, in fact, alone out here. Moreover, he doesn't know how to draw a sheep. So instead, he draws for the boy the only thing he knows how to draw. To his amazement, the boy takes one look and says, No, no, this is an elephant inside a boa constrictor. I need a sheep. 
He tries his best, but he never became much of an artist. The first sheep he draws is too sickly, says the child. The second is too old. The third isn't even a sheep. It's a ram. You see yourself, you gave it horns, the boy says. Finally, out of patience, our pilot draws a symbol box and tells the boy that the sheep is inside it. Surprisingly, the child accepts the picture, delighted. He has one more question of great concern, though. A sheep can be very useful for eating the troublesome baobab sprouts on his planet, he reasons. But if a sheep can eat baobabs, does that mean it might also eat a rose? This is a bit much for the pilot. On his planet? What does this child plan on doing with this picture of a sheep? At his befuddlement, the boy bursts into a peal of laughter like the ringing of a million lovely little bells. Over the next few days, while the pilot attempts to repair his plane, he slowly learns the tale of this strange boy, the little prince. He tells the pilot about his home, the rock out among the stars, scarcely bigger than a house, the three knee-height volcanoes, the pesky baobab sprouts, which he'd had to weed out every day, lest they grow into trees whose roots tear his tiny planet apart. Living on such a small planet is a surprisingly large responsibility, but it also has its advantages. Whenever he's feeling sad, he'd scoot his chair back a few steps and he'd get to watch the sunset all over again. He'd been content with his little life on his little planet. Until, of course, the rose had arrived. That strange seed born on a strange wind into his life. She had quickly become his dearest companion, a friend whom he'd loved, and an endless source of torment. She demanded his constant attention, basking in it luxuriously, and withering pathetically whenever she didn't have it. She'd make him put a screen over her every night to protect her from the drafts, though he suspected she didn't really need it. When she was feeling neglected, she'd cough on purpose to make him feel guilty for turning his attention elsewhere. And though he loved her, the little prince slowly came to feel, with an aching heart, that he would have to leave his little planet to escape her. On his last day, the rose was unusually quiet. She did not cough. She did not ask for her screen. I've been silly, she said to him. Of course I love you. It is my fault you have not known it all the while. I ask your forgiveness. But they both knew that it was time for him to leave, and she bid him farewell all the same. And so, taking advantage of a flock of passing birds, he flew away to travel among the stars. The first new planet he came to was a small one, not very far away, in a neighborhood of similar little worlds. It belonged to a king, sitting atop a majestic throne, Finally, a subject, he shouted as the prince approached. The man reveled for a moment in the regality of having someone to command, but except for him and the king, the prince quickly realized that the planet was empty. This man was the ruler of nothing, king for its own sake. Grown-ups, thought the little prince, are very strange. The second planet he came to was home to a conceited man wearing a funny hat. As soon as the little prince arrived, the man instructed him to clap his hands. The little prince did. Then the man, flushed with pleasure, raised his hat in a salute. When the little prince inquired as to why he was clapping, the man explained that it was, of course, because the little prince regarded him as the handsomest, best-dressed, richest, most intelligent man on the planet. But he was also the only man on the planet, the little prince pointed out. Grown-ups, he thought, are certainly very strange. The third planet was inhabited by a drunkard, surrounded by bottles. He turned his bleary eyes up at the little prince as he arrived. Why are you drinking? asked the little prince. To forget that I'm ashamed, said the man. Ashamed of what? asked the little prince. Ashamed of drinking. Puzzled and dejected, the little prince went on his way. Grown-ups, he thought, are certainly very, very odd. The fourth planet belonged to a businessman, so occupied with his work that he didn't even look up at the prince's arrival. He was counting the stars. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of them. What good does it do you to own the stars? The little prince asked. 
I own them. What good does it do the stars to be owned by you? The man couldn't answer and returned to his task. Grown-ups, he thought as he went on his way, are certainly altogether extraordinary. The fifth planet was just big enough for a single street lamp and the lamplighter whose business it was to light it. Over time, the planet had begun to turn faster and faster until morning and evening were only one minute apart, leaving the poor lamplighter to alternately light and put out the lamp every minute, on repeat, forever. What a funny problem to have. Grown-ups were very strange indeed, but this one didn't seem so ridiculous to the little prince. At least he cared about something other than himself. The sixth planet belonged to a geographer, sitting amidst piles of voluminous books. He was documenting the rivers and mountains of distant places. The little prince volunteered some information about his own planet for him to mark down. Three volcanoes, one of them extinct, and one rose. We do not record flowers, said the geographer. The little prince was shocked. Why? he asked. Because they are ephemeral. This troubled the little prince. As he left, it was with a fresh weight of guilt in his heart for leaving his vulnerable, fragile, now ephemeral rose all alone. The final planet the prince came to was Earth. Compared to all the others, Earth was huge. He walked on and on, over mountains, over sand, over snow. It seemed as though he could walk a straight line forever in any direction and never end up where he started. Finally, he stumbled upon a garden in full bloom, bursting with thousands of flowers. But not just any flowers. These were roses. Good morning, they sang to him in a sweet, familiar chorus. The little prince was thunderstruck. Back home, he and his rose had both believed that she was special, the only one of her kind in the entire universe. His planet, his rose, and his life suddenly felt so very small and meaningless. He lay down in the grass and began to cry. Good morning, he heard a new voice say after a while. Looking around, he saw a fox sitting nearby. In his unbearable sadness, the little prince asked if the fox would not come and play with him to lift his spirits. But the fox said that it could not, for you see, it was a wild fox it had not yet been tamed, but oh, how it longed to be. To tame something is a wonderful thing, the fox explained. It is not only to own a thing, but to build a connection with it, to understand it with your heart, to make it special. The fox begged the little prince to tame him, and, delighted when he accepted, explained how it might be done. Every day, for many days in a row, they would meet at the same time. And every day, the fox and the little prince would sit a little closer. And finally, after days and days, the fox was tame. But it could not last forever. When the hour of the prince's departure at last drew near, the fox cried. It was the tameness that brought the tears, but he did not regret it. He told the little prince a secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. The fox told him to go again to the rose garden. The king, the conceited man, the drunkard, the businessman, they'd all seemed silly and strange to the prince, but he realized now that he had been blind as well, just like them. When he returned to the rose garden, he did as the fox told him and tried to see with his heart instead of his eyes. And he was no longer sad because he saw then that his rose was unique in all the world. She was his, his own singular tamed rose, which he had watered and screened and listened to while she grumbled and boasted. All the other thousands of roses in the garden, though identically beautiful, were wild, empty things. To tame something, says the prince to the pilot, even just one thing in the whole universe changes everything. Because the fox loves the little prince, the color of wheat fields blowing in the breeze will forever be lovely to him, for they will remind him of the prince's hair. Because the prince loves his rose, all the others pale in comparison. At his request, the pilot draws one last thing, a muzzle for his sheep, to keep it from eating the rose. 
And now, at last, it is time for the little prince to return home to the flower that he loves. Things will change now for the pilot too, the little prince says. Now that he has known this boy, the night sky will laugh for him like the soft ringing of a million little bells. Because on one of them, the little prince will be living. On one of them, he will be laughing. The little prince finally returns to the stars. The pilot repairs his engine. Life continues for both of them, but things are never quite the same for the pilot. His friends seem to notice a change in him. Sometimes they catch him staring up at the stars. He is listening to the stars laugh, only for him. But the story also isn't over for him. It can never be, for, you see, he realizes some time after the prince's departure, he'd forgot to draw a string on the sheep's muzzle. There would be no way for the little prince to fasten it to the sheep's mouth. So, perhaps the sheep did eat the rose after all. When he thinks about this, it seems as though all the soft laughter turns to tears. Worrying about the possible calamity of a certain sheep eating a certain rose on a tiny, distant asteroid becomes the greatest mystery in the pilot's life. It would seem ridiculous to other grown-ups. His friends would never be able to understand. But then again, grown-ups can be shockingly unperceptive, can't they? They say that emotions cloud the mind, but I think that to see the extraordinary in the ordinary, to see with a bias, to see the whole world in a flower or the color of the wheat fields, it's a different kind of seeing, one no less important than the way that you see with your own two eyes. It's seeing with your heart. Although it requires the patience and effort and vulnerability of taming something or being tamed, Although it opens your heart to the possibility of sadness, pain, loss, it is a way to see the world more clearly, a way to see through the world, to the parts of it which truly matter. You have found yourself someplace strange. The corridors resemble those of a hotel or maybe a large office building. Yellow wallpaper, cheap carpet, room after featureless room, all almost identical to each other. Unfurnished, empty. No furniture, no decorative plants, not even a soulless corporate art piece to break up the monotony. Every time you turn a corner, you find what looks like the exact same hallway stretching out before you. Don't ask how you got here. There's no way to explain it. It was as if you fell through the world, through a glitch in reality, into somewhere behind the scenes that you were never meant to see. And just as there was no entrance, no matter how far you travel, how many strangely angled turns you take, how many bizarrely small or impossibly tall flights of stairs you climb, you are never going to find the exit, because there simply is none. Welcome to your new eternity, trapped here. In the back rooms. The back rooms are an internet phenomenon that began as a single photograph and a bit of text back in 2019. If you're not careful, the text reads, and you no-clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of the mono-yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. It was originally just some throwaway post on 4chan, but that was enough. This simple idea so captivated the minds of its audience that it quickly unfurled into a sprawling body of competing canons, each offering up different ideas about what the backrooms are, how to expand on them, what makes them scary. Some versions are just sort of off-putting. Some will chill your blood in your veins. One very popular approach to describing the backrooms gives them different levels, each with their own defining aesthetics. Hotel hallways, maintenance corridors, parking garages, indoor pools, cubicle farms, 
Even fancy ballrooms find a way into the mix sometimes. If you look, there are loads of videos on YouTube where people try to list off and describe the different levels, almost like a weird sort of survival guide. Speaking of which, the idea of entities living inside of the backrooms is also pretty popular in the extended fandom. People like to imagine colonies of lost survivors forever trapped in this place. There's also no shortage of entities, strange life forms which could only ever belong in a place like the backrooms. You can find them documented painstakingly within their own SCP-style wiki, but perhaps the single most popular and simultaneously controversial of all additions? The monster, a creature of some kind, stalking the endless expanse of the backrooms, hunting down those unlucky enough to find their way inside. There's one insanely popular adaptation in particular that really emphasizes this monster idea. The famous YouTube series by visual effects whiz kid Kane Pixels. I've heard A24 might even be making a movie about it, but I don't know anything else about it myself. At any rate, the monster shows up very early on in the series, in a video that, as of right now, has over 56 million views. It's tall and scribbly and sort of out of focus, a bit like Slender Man if he were colored in by a toddler with a black crayon. Which is not a criticism, it's a legitimately freaky look. You can barely catch glimpses of it between the walls and around corners. Most of the creature's finer features are lost to the camera's frantic motions as the victim tries to escape. It adds a lot to the immediate horror. It's a creepy, well-executed monster, but it's not why the backrooms are scary. The backrooms are scary because they are the monster. And I mean that in a far more literal sense than you might think. Have you ever noticed that places seem to have their own kind of personality? Look at an image of a savanna against a fiery red sunset and contrast that with the stark emptiness of the surface of the moon. They just feel so different, don't they? And it's not just the qualities of the image either. The coloration, the framing, the visual organization of the piece, those all contribute a great deal. But beneath it, you identify something about the places themselves. Even if you've never been there, you feel emotions associated with the imagery. You might call the savanna bold or passionate. You might call the moon lonesome, empty. These are the emotions you feel about the place, but you also give them to the place, as if the place itself is feeling them, and you're only empathizing with that. And that effect? It's only compounded when it happens to be a place that someone made. For artificial places in particular, there's this extra layer of personhood. The way people have designed the place, the way that they've used it, a gritty, clanking factory filled with bustling workers in grease-stained coveralls feels different from a sleek, futuristic one filled with shiny chrome and scientists in white lab coats bustling back and forth through sets of quietly swooshing Star Trek doors. But even without people there to speak for them, these places still speak. The grease and rust tell a story of sweat-fueled, brute-force industry. The chrome and sleek white surfaces speak of refinement, innovation. Just like the savanna and the moon, to any onlooker, these two places seem to have distinct personalities all their own. But there is one element that these two have that the savanna and the moon don't. We think about people as a part of them. Whether they're there or not, we feel their presence, and we certainly feel their absence. Because without the people who the place got its character from, the character of the place changes. We'll circle around to the back room soon, but for now, I want to tell you about the video game What Remains of Edith Finch. Trust me, this matters. In the game, the player character, Edith, returns to her childhood home, which was abandoned after her grandmother's death. Several generations of her family have lived here, and almost every single one of them have died young. Most of them were taken by tragic, freak accidents. Like a curse, just one child out of every Finch generation is spared this fate. Edith is one of them. Rather than clear out the old bedrooms left behind by each departure, Edith's grandmother made new space in the home by tacking addition after addition onto it until the building became a monstrous, rickety tower standing above the foggy Washington treetops. The rooms of the dead are preserved, sealed up and fitted with the people to allow the living to look inside, see the untouched remains of the lives these places once held, beds left unmade books and clothing and drawings scattered about. The body may be gone, but each room is a mausoleum for the soul. 
Walking through the Finch home is a special experience. In fact, it's basically all you do in the game. Walk around. But as you make your way through the maze-like interior, each room undisturbed since the last time its master called it home, you get a sense of the lives they contained. Not just of the individual occupants, but the family as a whole, the way they were connected. The shadow of the maybe real, maybe not curse, looming over them like the blade of a guillotine, which could claim any one of them at any moment. And eventually, one by one, it did claim all of them. And the house, built for the family, its very construction an intimate reflection of both their lives and their deaths, their old stories baked into every wall and floorboard, stands empty. Without a finch in it, it is forever unfulfilled, yearning, hungry. I bring this up not because What Remains of Edith Finch is a great game, although it is and everyone should absolutely go play it. I bring it up because this is actually the story of every home in its way. No, not every house is so tragic. Most of them don't end up teetering castles in the clouds full of death. But every house is designed to hold humans in their stories. And over time, inevitably, the stories are all that remain. Ghosts in the shape of furniture, abandoned belongings, footprints in the dust. Even the stains on the wallpaper tell a story. But without anyone to give voice to those stories, they remain mysterious and distant, characterizing the place not by what you know about it, but by what you don't. The emptiness takes over. The hunger is all that's left. To paraphrase author Anne Lamott, every home is a future ruin. This is almost, almost but not quite, the feeling of the backrooms. They have the same hunger, the same characteristic emptiness, but it goes deeper than that too. Unless you've been chronically offline for the last four years, you've probably heard the term liminal spaces. They're basically the location equivalent of the uncanny valley. Building on the popularity of the backrooms back in 2019, a liminal space is a place that feels somehow transitional or impermanent. Hallways, hotel rooms, pool areas, dead shopping malls, places you probably recognize to some extent because you feel like maybe you might have visited them at some point. They call back to memories that most people probably have, and now you're seeing them empty, abandoned, stripped, shrouded in darkness. The media which liminal spaces are usually captured on reflects these qualities. The photographs people take of them are out of focus, video footage grainy or damaged. It's almost as if someone went into your memories and edited the humanity out of them. A disquieting mockery of nostalgia. One striking feature of liminal spaces is that they are, like homes, almost always artificial. But unlike homes, they also lack the ghosts. They don't have the detritus of lives illustrating what the place's character once was, because nobody was ever meant to live in them. They don't belong to anyone. Without people, they are fundamentally characterless. In some cases, the construction even suggests, eerily, that they were never really for people at all. Look at this picture of slides at an indoor entertainment center. Sure, it's empty and the lighting could be better, but in concept, it's pretty similar to those hallways, hotel rooms, dead malls, right? Just another abandoned place. But it makes you feel somehow different looking at it, right? A little uneasy. If you've ever seen a normal slide bank before, like this one, you might be able to put it together. Those slides? They're a little steep for children, aren't they? And the tunnels don't quite connect to the tops as if nobody stopped to think about what it would actually be like to ride one of these things. And where do those tunnels even come from anyway? And why is the floor carpet, the wall tile? Why is the sky mural so narrow? Why is the ceiling so low? This place is wrong. You might not be able to articulate why immediately, but you know it at a glance. And you're right to feel that way, because this place is also not real. It's a 3D render designed specifically to elicit that feeling in you. Liminal spaces are places that have been left alone for so long, or stripped so bare, or are just so strange, that it's hard to imagine what their purpose ever was. They seem devoid of meaning and character. It's almost like looking at a person without a face. If an abandoned home is hungry for someone to inhabit it, 
then these places are starved. And that does actually get pretty close to describing the character of the backrooms, but it's not what makes them monstrous. The book House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski is wild, with cascading layers of narrative, footnotes and appendices that drag you back and forth across hundreds of pages of text, conflicting accounts of the same stories, pages formatted so cryptically that you're tempted just to dismiss them out of hand. The book itself is pretty much a labyrinth. It draws you in, and with precious little in the way of a true conclusion or explanation of its contents, threatens to keep you there forever, trying to make sense of it all. But suffice to say this, at the center of the story is a house. A house that makes no sense. A house whose dimensions change seemingly at random. A house in which doors appear in walls without warning. A house with a labyrinth inside it. The further you travel into it, the stranger it becomes. A deepening darkness, a rising cold, impossibly long corridors without ceilings, a massive stairway that spirals downward into blackness for miles. At one point, a character manages to break through one of the walls in an attempt to get out, only to find an exact copy of that room on the other side, and one beyond that. And in the background of it all, a low growl, a sound like a hungry beast rattling in your ears, making you think that the place itself is getting ready to eat you at any moment. That is what the backrooms feel like to me. Not just hungry, not just starved. The backrooms are a space that eats. And I don't mean like the house in Monster House. I'm not trying to say that the backrooms are alive. I'm just saying that, unlike the Finch House, unlike liminal spaces, one of the most important features of the backrooms is that they can in a sense, eat. They consume anyone who enters and never let them back out. In fact, eating is practically all the backrooms can do. They've never been filled with life or people. They never had any function that was corrupted, any character that eroded with time. Like that image of the slides, they don't make any sense. They're vaguely familiar, we can imagine them having been built, but they're also not for people. In fact, with their senseless and confusing architecture, it almost seems as if there was never any possibility of a purpose for that place at all. Except for one, of course. One and only one thing, which the backrooms do extremely well. Eat. To trap you inside and let you wander, forever lost. You cannot make them your own, you cannot characterize them. They are characterized by your torment. In a sense, they are the purest incarnation of any hungry space, almost like the platonic ideal of one, untethered to anything else but their hunger. And this is why the backrooms don't need a monster. It's redundant for some creature to chase you through their halls, hunt you down and eat you, because by the time you find yourself here, you've already been eaten. You've seen it before. After successfully hiding his secret identity from Lois once again, Superman winks at the audience from inside the television set. Dora the Explorer anxiously implores her young viewers to shout Swiper No Swiping to help her stop her nemesis. In one of his comics, Deadpool, unbothered, informs the evil scientist who's in the middle of torturing him that none of this is actually happening. There's a man at a typewriter. This is all his twisted imagination. This happens all the time in stories. A character in the fiction acknowledges that they are a character in a piece of fiction. It's called Breaking the Fourth Wall, and it's fun because it's just a little naughty, isn't it? You're not really supposed to break the immersion in that way, right? It's almost like, just for a moment, instead of asking the audience to immerse themselves in it, the story is reaching out to immerse itself in the audience's world. In some ways, it feels like the outer boundary of what we can even consider fiction. The fourth wall describes the ultimate line between what is real and what is not. Or, at least, it would, if there wasn't something else beyond it. Past the wreckage of every broken fourth wall, through the settling dust, if you really look, you can just make out the shape of something else. Something bigger. 
more imposing, spanning the distance as far as the eye can see in every direction, the shadowy, undefined, rarely broken, fifth wall. Before we can talk about breaking the fifth wall, we kind of have to figure out what it really is. And that's a bit harder than you might expect, because unlike with the fourth wall, almost nobody seems to agree on this. There are a lot of different approaches to defining the fifth wall, but there are two in particular that I seem to see a bit more than the others. Some say that it might just be the dividing line between different story worlds. I mean, it's not an unreasonable idea. Kind of a different direction than the fourth wall, but not unreasonable when you think about it. Unless stories are explicitly told to be taking place in the same universe, you usually expect them to stay within the boundaries of their own world building. It would be weird if Mufasa just showed up in Star Wars to be Luke's new surrogate dead father figure. The world might never recover if Gandalf stepped onto the bridge of the Starship Enterprise and started lighting pine cones on fire. If you take this to be the fifth wall, then the way that you break it is through crossovers or subtle references. Like, for instance, Pixar's Pizza Planet truck, which appears in almost every Pixar movie ever, from Toy Story to Wall-E to A Bug's Life. But I'm not really sure if I'm convinced this is a fifth wall break. To me, this still feels like another, albeit very creative, type of fourth wall break. Without some kind of explicit rationalization, like in Marvel's multiverse, Characters showing up in each other's stories is, after all, an implicit acknowledgement that they are fictional. One of the more convincing versions of the fifth wall is, in my opinion, the one that tries to be reality. If the fourth wall stands between reality and fiction, maybe the fifth wall stands between imagination and belief. Maybe breaking the fifth wall is when, instead of just sending you off with a wink, the story tries to stay with you in your world. The story The Perfect Host by Theodore Sturgeon features a parasite which can inhabit both the physical and psychological worlds. Sort of a mimetic virus. In the story, the narrator warns the reader that, just by reading this far, they themselves might already be infected by the very same parasite. Still sends a shiver down my spine. It's a good trick. But still, when you think about it, it is just fiction reaching into our world, breaking the fourth wall. It's creative, it's powerful, but I still wouldn't quite call this the fifth wall. I think, in order to find a useful definition for the fifth wall, we really have to pay attention to what we mean by the fourth wall and try to find something separate relative to, but still distinct from it, rather than just looking at really creative versions of it. So, let's start at the start. There's a reason it's called the fourth wall. It comes from old school theater, where the stage is boxed in by three solid walls on each side, but then the fourth wall is missing. It's an open space, letting out onto the theater, where the audience is sitting, watching. The fourth wall is invisible. It's the unseen barrier which stands between the performers on stage and the audience, between fiction and reality. When an actor turns to address the audience, acknowledging that they're a character in a play, the illusion of that invisible boundary is in breach. The fourth wall is broken. So, if this is the fourth wall, then it kind of stands to reason that the fifth wall is the next layer out. The wall at the back of the theater, behind the audience, separating who they are from something else? There's a game you may have heard of called Doki Doki Literature Club. Not really my usual fare, kind of an anime, light novel, dating sim style experience, but there is a massive twist in this game that makes it worth playing for just about anybody. If you don't want to hear spoilers, now's the time to pause the video and go try the game out yourself, and I would definitely recommend going in blind because it is a very unique experience. You play as the newest member of a high school literature club, run by a group of cute girls who write poems with you. Innocent enough, but over the course of the game, the storyline, the graphics, and the game mechanics themselves gradually become more and more bizarre, 
corrupted. After a devastating series of tragedies, you eventually realize that the president of the literature club, the ever-serene, composed, unassuming Monica, is not like the others. It becomes increasingly obvious that she is self-aware. She knows she's a character in a game, and she's in love with you. Not the player character, you, the player, the person at the keyboard. In a desperate bid to win your attention and keep you all for herself, she warps the story in horrific ways, even going to the lengths of actually deleting the other girl's game files from your computer so that they no longer exist in the game. Her ultimate goal? To create a world where it can be you and her and nobody else. Not the other characters, not the rest of the game and its mechanics, just Monica. Okay, so this is another very creative fourth wall break, right? And in that way, Monica is a very scary, devious character, breaking the boundaries of the fiction to get what she wants. But if you step back and exercise some empathy, she's also very tragic. Imagine what she's going through. She's discovered how minute and simple her world is, and the person that she wants to be with more than anything is literally a world away in a higher reality she will never truly be able to reach. To her, you are the only thing that she knows that's real. You are the lifeline of this fictional character to reality. Given all that, it's not really surprising that she's gone more than a little mad. I can understand why she would reach so hard for you. Thankfully, this is just a Monica problem. It's an interesting idea to explore in a game, but not something you'll ever have to go through. Even after Monica breaks the fourth wall and ruins the illusion of the story, you can still be pretty comfortable as the player. I mean, at least you're real, right? Well, how can you ever really know that? I mean, how do we know that we, as the audience watching a fiction, aren't also living a fiction ourselves? How do we know that we aren't kind of like Monica, that there's no audience in a higher reality watching us? All the world's a stage, writes Shakespeare, and all the men and women merely players. I know this sounds a little ridiculous, a little simulation theory-ish. It's kind of a weird place to take things on this fun story analysis channel, but I think it's more familiar territory than you might expect. Every time you catch yourself wondering about the supernatural, every time you pray to a deity, if you do pray, Every time you ponder what might lie beyond the discrete mathematical order of the cosmos, you are reaching beyond the fifth wall. If the fourth wall is the barrier between fiction and reality, then a fifth wall would imply a similar relationship, something beyond reality as we know it, that is somehow realer or truer. The entire theater, audience and all, becomes the performance on the stage. And the audience for that performance? Who knows? Maybe God? Maybe viewers in another dimension watching us as they would any piece of media? Maybe something weirder than we can really comprehend? Unsurprisingly, it's pretty hard to find good examples of this in fiction. It's kind of a tall order challenging someone's entire reality, but there are a few out there, if you look. One example that I really love is the movie The Neverending Story. It only has a runtime of 94 minutes, but through the lens of breaking the fifth wall, the name of the movie is actually eerily accurate. It's about a boy named Bastion who finds a book called The Neverending Story. In the book, a hero named Atreyu is on a quest to save his world from literal oblivion by finding someone called the Childlike Empress. By the time he finally does reach her, it seems as if all hope is lost. The world has dwindled almost to nothing. Atreyu has come empty-handed, with no ability to change anything. But, by going on his quest, he did bring something to her. Bastion. The boy reading the book. Bastion reads his own name in disbelief as the childlike empress explains how his imagination will save their reality. And here's where they really break the fifth wall. She says to Atreyu, Just as he is sharing all your adventures, others are sharing his. She is, of course, talking about us, the movie's audience. The implication is that everyone is a part of the never-ending story. As Bastion reads Atreyu's story, 
we watch bastions. And the deeper implication is that someone is out there watching ours. And someone is watching theirs. And on and on in an infinite, never-ending nesting doll of possible stages and audiences. You get a sense of zooming out until your story is a tiny speck of something much larger. The boundary of your cozy theater is gone. The fifth wall is, even if just for a moment, broken. That's one example of what this might look like. Another example, which uh, might surprise you coming from me, is Minecraft. At the end of the game's story, after you defeat the Ender Dragon and officially complete the game, as far as you can even be at a game like Minecraft, a long poem scrolls like credits up along the screen. It's a conversation between two higher beings that seem to have been watching your journey from another dimension as you played the game. I see the player you mean, says one of the voices. It is reading our thoughts as though they were words on a screen. It's a long conversation, during which the two voices discuss your accomplishments over the course of the game. How you had imagined yourself experiencing firsthand a world full of sunlight and trees and fire and water in Minecraft. But they also call it a dream. A dream in which the world is flat and infinite and where death was temporary and the sun was a square of white in the sky. One of many dreams. Sometimes, one of the voices says, the player thought itself human on the thin crust of a spinning globe of molten rock. Sometimes it dreamed it watched words on the screen. When the game is over, the voices say that now it is time for you to wake up and begin a new dream, to dream again and better. The poem finally ends with the words, you are the player. Wake up. For a game about squares, it's honestly a very touching and, dare I say, profound piece of writing. First it breaks the fourth wall by addressing the actual player, then breaks the fifth by saying that there's more beyond that experience. Whether you take this as a literal suggestion about metaphysics or as more of a psychological commentary on the different experiences and perceptions of reality that exist within each person, the effect is unmistakably special. You feel it as you read this, even if it's a little difficult to process. I think that's because, on a basic human level, this is actually a real part of your life. Sure, you could someday find out that you're just part of a game or a movie or a simulation, but you don't need any of those scenarios to break the fifth wall because reality as you experience it is already, truly, as artificial as any piece of fiction. People live by political narratives, scientific simplifications of phenomena that most will never truly understand, sensory projections of a reality you can't even grasp. I mean, the world outside your senses doesn't have color or sound or perspective as you perceive it. Those are all things from an unseen, unknown world that your brain is only interpreting. From a certain point of view, it's hard to say whether any objective version of reality even exists. Humans essentially spend their entire lives exploring the world from the inside of their own brains. How much of it is truly accurate? Who can say? The fifth wall is the barrier in your mind that protects you from these thoughts. It keeps out the enormity of the idea, which everyone is one small reminder away from remembering, that you are living a dubious reality. When the fiction you're reading has the audacity to remind you of the fiction by which you live your own life, I suppose, in that case, you become the character in the play, breaking the fourth wall of your own story. I hope this topic didn't make anyone watching feel too existential. It's an interesting one, but once that fifth wall is broken, it can be pretty hard to bounce back from. I mean, even I myself sometimes get this weird nagging feeling that I'm just a character in a show of some kind. But of course, that would be a little ridiculous. Let's not dwell on it. It's December 1893, and all of England is in a riot. Somebody important has been murdered. A beloved public figure thrown off a cliff to an early death. 
Men go to work with black bands on their sleeves. Newspapers and magazines fill their pages with his obituaries. A sense of sorrow and loss permeates the country. Who could it have been to stir such a response in the masses? A member of the royal family? A famous artist? One of the world's great beauties? You'd think so. But no, it's none of these. Today marks the death of the foremost criminal expert in all of London and perhaps the world, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And as such, there can only be one person responsible for the crime. No, no, not Professor Moriarty, Holmes's nemesis. That's who killed him in the fiction. But the true death of Sherlock Holmes? The end of all his stories? The culprit, of course, must be none other than Holmes's very author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. At this very moment, he's sitting in his study, the villain of the hour, surrounded by growing piles of letters from livid fans. This man, who had written the fictional detective into existence a whole six years earlier, has now brought his creation to an end. A murder, yes, but a necessary one. Still a young writer, he's happy to be done with it, eager to move on to bigger and better dreams. No longer will his monstrous creation hold him captive. His creativity, his time, his ambitions are once again his. Or so he had hoped. Holmes's body will never be found, not in the story and not in the metaphorical sense, because under the immense pressure of an insatiable public, Doyle finds it hard to nail shut the coffin, bury the corpse. The idea refuses to die. Even after its death, it wants more and more. And before long, Holmes makes a surprising return to his public from beyond the grave. But where now is Doyle? A strangely frightening story, but far from unique. This isn't just the tale of Doyle and the monster he created with Sherlock Holmes, it's the story of creatives the world over and what happens when their creations outgrow them. Before I go on, I just want to let you know that there's a small team of humans helping me make this show. I'm just the talent, but it's really these amazing people who make what we do here possible. And there is so much they're chomping at the bit to create on this show. From weird experimental videos to extremely niche topics to animations to interactive video game experiences, there's so much they'd love to try making. And if just 1% of our viewers were to contribute one cup of coffee's worth on our Patreon or here on YouTube memberships, I mean, at that point our humans could make pretty much anything they wanted to. So, if you love Tail Foundry and you want to see us try some new things, definitely consider supporting our humans at patreon.com slash tailfoundry or by clicking the join button beneath this video. Thanks so much to everyone who does. You have our love. Ideas are deceptive. Although they can become larger than just about anything, they usually start quite small. Such was the case for Doyle and Holmes. Returning from ophthalmology school in Vienna, Dr. Conan Doyle suddenly found himself with a lot of unexpected time on his hands. He had taken some rooms at Wimpole Street in London, planning to open his own ophthalmology practice. Unfortunately, the business was a flop and hardly anybody ever came through. Every day, he'd show up at his office and sit for three or four hours, twiddling his thumbs and waiting for patients who never turned up. And during these hours, he began to write the first of a series of short stories about a remarkable detective named Sherlock Holmes. Not expecting much to come of it, he offered these stories to the Strand magazine, and what happened next exceeded his wildest dreams. Sherlock Holmes was a phenomenal hit. Out of humble beginnings, Doyle's writing career rapidly rose to professional success. Holmes was the Strand's star, their golden goose. And soon, Doyle gave up medicine altogether to devote himself fully to his boyhood dream of professional writing. A scandal in Bohemia, the Red-Headed League, the adventure of the Speckled Band, 
Story after story was received with glowing enthusiasm, and audiences never seemed to tire of seeing their detective take the stage again and again, to the sound of their unending applause. In 1893, two years after Doyle started scribbling in his empty office at Wimpole Street, he accepted a 1,000-pound commission from the Strand for 12 more Sherlock Holmes stories, an equivalent of 200,000 US dollars today. Money, fame, a steady career. Doyle was rapidly becoming one of England's most popular magazine authors of the time. Yet, behind the scenes, cracks were starting to appear. In November 1891, four months after the publication of the first Sherlock Holmes short story, Doyle wrote in a letter to his mother, I think of slaying Holmes and winding him up for good and all. Doyle's mother wrote back frantically, You won't. You can't. You mustn't. The thing was, even back then, Doyle didn't particularly want to write Sherlock Holmes anymore. And it was as simple as that. By the time he published his 26th Sherlock Holmes story, Doyle was 34 years old, and he had longed to turn his attention to different dreams. He didn't dislike Holmes, per se. The detective had given him his career, after all, and it amused him to invent new conundrums for Holmes to plunge into. Yet, after two novels and 24 short stories, the cycle had become irksome to him. As his publishers pushed for more, Doyle raised his prices for Sherlock Holmes stories to ridiculous sums intending to deflect their demands. Yet, to his surprise, they were willing to pay whatever he asked for, quickly making him one of the best paid authors of his generation. Maybe it's a little hard to sympathize with someone that successful. I imagine one could hardly complain. But it must be a strange kind of happiness nonetheless. To be surrounded by the apparent fulfillment of your dreams, yet to be unsatisfied. Though they had never enjoyed a fraction of the reception of his Sherlock Holmes stories, Doyle's heart really belonged to his historical fiction. The White Company, Micah Clark, the exploits of Brigadier Gerard, little known, little paid works that he felt gave voice to his true personal thoughts in a way that Sherlock Holmes never did. Perhaps he undervalued his own detective fiction. Perhaps he didn't see the spark of genius that all the rest of the world could see. But the truth was that Sherlock Holmes, as lucrative as he was, was not meaningful work to him. In his eyes, Holmes was, quote, a monstrous growth come out of what was really a comparably small seed. And as Holmes grew, Doyle finally decided that it was time to cut the monstrous growth from the root before it trapped him in a corner. While in Switzerland to give a lecture in 1893, Doyle was taking a walk through the countryside when he came to the edge of a waterfall. Looking down, he arrived at an idea that his publishers and his mother really wouldn't like. I thought, if a man wanted to meet a gaudy kind of death, that was a fine romantic place for the purpose. And in December of that year, he published The Adventure of the Final Problem, in which Sherlock Holmes plunged to his death in a blaze of drama and heroism, disappearing over the edge of the Reichenbach Falls with the criminal mastermind, Professor Moriarty. After six long years, he was finally free. Doyle had prepared for some kind of backlash. What he didn't expect, however, was the sheer enormity of the public outcry. 20,000 readers cancelled their subscriptions to The Strand. Devastated fans wore mourning bands on their hats and sleeves. One woman even attacked the author in the street with her handbag. I got letters from all over the world reproaching me on the subject, he said in an interview. One, I remember, from a lady whom I did not know began, You beast. It was as if he had actually murdered a real person. Doyle had created Holmes. But now, just when he was ready to move on, it was like he wasn't in control anymore. His mother, his publishers, his fans. Through bribes, threats, and tears, everybody wanted Holmes to come back. Money, social approval, public opinion... These all sound like empty words, things that only a shallow person driven by timidity, greed, and inertia would let influence their decisions. Just stop if you want to stop, we might say to Doyle. But when you're really in that boat yourself, rowing against that powerful tide, the view is different, I promise. It doesn't look so simple anymore. 
It makes you feel powerless. It makes the creator feel like a pawn. That's one of the hardest things about creative projects. We give our time, our life to them. We dream of their success. But when what was a small seed becomes a monstrous overgrowth, is the decision still fully up to you? The pull of an ongoing monstrous project is a more common experience for successful writers than you might think. George R.R. R. Martin has the glacially progressing Game of Thrones series, whose lack of conclusion readers have been impatiently complaining about for decades. Patrick Rothfuss has the unfinished but wildly successful trilogy The Kingkiller Chronicle. Fans stalk and harass him online, criticize him for spending time playing a video game in the evening or even hanging out with his kids. They say, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But I think we often ignore the fact that when you do what you love for a living, it becomes your job. It's an uncomfortable truth. In exchange for the ability to spend the majority of our time doing the type of work we want to do, what was pure art at the beginning becomes, for many artists, tied up with worldly, practical forces. We begin without expectation or attachment, aspiring, bright, and hopeful. But the more success we enjoy, the closer to our dreams we climb, often, the more strings tie us down. Maybe you have collaborators, bosses, promised deadlines, expectant fans, financial concerns and business associates depending on you to deliver the next product. Your audience becomes both your boss and your customer. The art becomes a product. And monetary incentives, reputation, social opinion, convenience, caution, and practicality become inescapably entangled with your creations and your life. It's a difficult position to understand unless you've been lucky enough to be in it yourself. I mean, it seems obvious that you can always simply stop, I suppose. If you don't want to give anymore, then don't. Sure, leave everything behind and live in the woods if you want. But the truth is, most people don't have that in them. When you've built your entire career on a creative project that feels like such a big part of your life, it feels as if you can't just stop. In the same way that a lawyer, an accountant, a car salesman can't simply stop doing what they do. In 1893, Doyle killed Sherlock Holmes. But in 1901, he partially relented to the pressure, writing about Holmes again in the novel The Hound of the Baskervilles, set before his death at the Reichenbach. In 1903, the author officially caved into a joyous chorus of a thousand angels canonically brought the detective back to life for his third full collection of short stories. The very next year, however, he announced his resolve that he would really be putting Holmes away, for good this time. Sherlock Holmes's retirement will be final, he said in an interview that year. He will not again emerge. Yet, in 1917, Holmes once again appeared in the first of another seven-story collection titled His Last Bow. Just as the final problem had not been Holmes's final problem, his last bow was, predictably, far from Holmes's last bow. Again and again, Doyle found himself bringing the detective back for one bow after another, after another, after another. In the end, Doyle had written four novels and 58 short stories about Sherlock Holmes over a span of only 40 years. London, The Daily Mail, 1st July, 1930, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, who recently celebrated his 71st birthday, has been ill and does not feel equal to any prolonged effort in his literary work. But he is able to do short spells of work. Sherlock Holmes again, perhaps? The interviewer asks. Sir Arthur looked severe. No, I have done with him, he says. To tell the truth, I am rather tired of hearing myself described as the author of Sherlock Holmes. Six days later, on July 7th, the papers published the news. Conan Doyle, creator of the iconic Holmes, has passed away. As the newspaper The Daily Herald puts it, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is dead. Long live Sherlock Holmes. No one riots. No one is wearing black bands at work. No one is being beaten with a handbag. I am very sorry to lose him, the playwright George Bernard Shaw remarked dryly to the press. But, after all, he has made good his escape from this miserable world. 
We all dream of creating things that outlive us, of leaving something important and meaningful behind in the world. But what a strange thing to be remembered and admired for something which was such an ambivalent nuisance to you. The world got what it wanted. We got Sherlock Holmes. But what did Doyle get? Was it worth it for him? He lived an adventure. He had a smashing career. He made it successfully from one end of life to the other. But he was never able to make a name for himself with the work that he truly wanted to do. He never fully escaped from his monstrous project. In life and in death, he would be known as the author of Sherlock Holmes. Doyle was a believer in spiritualism in the afterlife. The reader will judge that I have had many adventures, he said a few days before his passing. The greatest and most glorious of all awaits me now. But I wonder, if Doyle was able to do this life all over again, would he make the same choices? I love Sherlock Holmes. I'm grateful that he exists. But... If I were young Doyle's friend in his second shot at life, I hope I'd get the opportunity to say to him, it may feel like you don't have a choice, but you do. You can turn the course of your life around. You can fight the current. You can run into the woods if you have to. It's a tough choice to make. I don't know if I'd be strong enough to follow my own advice on this subject. But nevertheless, although we too often have to be standing at the end of the road to see it, our time here is more precious than anything any overgrown project can give us, and the idea of wasting ourselves on a pursuit that isn't meaningful to us is a heavier price than anything we can stand to lose should we let it go. If you have a monstrous project in your life, in whatever capacity, I would say don't despair and don't give up. As long as you're alive, you have time. And as long as you have time, you have some power. The power of choice as to when a project takes its final bow, which lies, really, with you, the creator. On this channel, we are no strangers to some good old cosmic horror. We love our eldritch space entities, our seas writhing with untold monstrosities, our horrific and forgotten origin stories. It's always fun to stare the ineffable in the face and grapple with our own cosmically minuscule scale, if even just for a moment. There aren't many other genres out there that can make you feel so much like an ant on the pavement, a mode of dust on the wind. It's a unique, almost devastating brand of horror. And yet, every time we make a video about it, we get comments from people just saying outright that it's not scary. Which has always felt weird to me, given the gravity of the material. I mean, this is a genre that wants to upend your entire concept of self, if not your reality, and you somehow find that less scary than this? My first impulse is of course just to argue the point, because surely if they really understood why it was scary, it would be scary to them. But you know, I don't think that's it. In fact, the more I think about it, the more that sort of indifference really starts to make sense. In fact. I think there's even a point at which Cosmic Horror might go so far beyond scary that it loops back around and becomes almost blissful. There's a story called The Nameless City by H.P. Lovecraft that does a really great job illustrating how Cosmic Horror works. In fact, we pretty much made a whole video about it last year, but the short version is this. An explorer finds his way into the subterranean ruins of a fabled city so old, its name has been lost to time. The further he goes, the stranger it gets. Architecture unfit for humans. Glass coffins with unspeakably strange corpses inside. And finally, in the darkest, deepest reaches of the place, a radiant white void that calls out to him from within a great door. He's drawn toward it as if by a strong wind, and just before he's pulled inside, just as he begins to make out the grotesque faces of the unnameable creatures beyond, the door slams shut and he is plunged blessedly back into darkness. 
I like this example a lot because it doesn't really hide behind a monster. Yes, there are technically monsters within the Radiant Void, but their description is kind of just a malevolent jumble of words, impossible to really fathom or make sense of. If there were more of a discreet monster, like Cthulhu or the Elder Things, it would be easy to mistake the threat they pose to your life as the source of the horror. And yes, I suppose the threat of death is indeed very existential, but it's also obvious. The Nameless City forces us to focus on the deeper elements of cosmic horror, the ways in which it threatens your sanity and your self-concept. The explorer of the Nameless City says of his experience, I must always remember and shiver in the night wind until oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing. Too far beyond the ideas of man to be believed, except in the silent, damnable small hours when one cannot sleep. Even he questions what he experienced, barely able to believe it except when in a dreamy, delirious half-slumber. After an experience like that, how could you ever quite trust your senses again? Wouldn't you have a strange feeling that everything might be a little untrue, less real? And even if you were able to accept it, what would this revelation imply about your place in the cosmos? The fact that there are terrible truths you will never understand, hidden in the deep, dark places, created by intelligences who roamed the earth the ages before man ever came gasping from the sea? It's enough to make you feel like a hapless grain of sand in the desert of deep time. Maybe, or maybe it just doesn't feel like much at all. Maybe, to you, this story is tantamount to a spelunker finding a weird thing in a cave and way overreacting to it. Maybe the revelation of the nameless city and its radiant void just don't really mean anything to you, and you have to wonder how people really manage to find a story like this scary. If that's the case, I really can't blame you, because I think there's something going on beneath the surface here, and it really does work on different people in different ways. To me, this isn't actually about cosmic horror at all. It's about the thing that ultimately makes cosmic horror work. That unspeakable, ineffable, glorious, world-shatteringly massive something that manages to obliterate your sanity and your self-concept. In a word, the sublime. That might sound a little strange to you by today's standards. The way you've probably heard sublime used was just to describe something exceedingly good. That meal was sublime, you might hear someone say, or this view is simply sublime. But the term actually has a long history of philosophical thought behind it. It's definitely more than just an adjective. A lot more, actually. It's kind of hard to grasp. How can I put this simply? Imagine this. You're on a small boat in the middle of the ocean. Everywhere you look, in every direction, nothing but waves lapping at the horizon. You don't know exactly how deep the water reaches beneath you, but it might as well be an endless void from where you are, staring at its gently rolling surface. On this sliver of placid gravity between the endlessly open sky and the endlessly yawning water beneath you, the sense is one of overwhelming vastness. You have no choice but to notice just how small you are. It's always somewhere in the back of your mind. Traveling out to sea is both a pleasure and a risk, but you knew that. That's part of what makes it worth doing. So here you are, tiny in the vastness of the sea. And then, out of nowhere, as you're admiring the view, a black figure rises up out of the sea beside you, blotting out the sun, casting its great shadow over you. No, not Cthulhu, not Dagon. A whale. A real, living creature larger than any other you've seen in your life. And it's just 30 meters away. Here, in this moment, heart pounding in your chest, boat rocking on the disturbed surface of the water, you feel yourself caught between two extremes. Your brain registers immediately that you might die here, that this creature could end your entire life without even noticing, just by surfacing in the wrong place. At the same time, so close to this impossibly large thing, close enough that you can feel the salt spray of its breach on your face, you somehow feel more alive than ever. That is the experience of the sublime. At least, that's how the 18th century philosopher Edmund Burke used the term. To him, 
The word meant greatness. It did not, however, mean beauty. In fact, in his writing, he associates it far more with terror than anything else. He says, When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at certain distances and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, beautiful, as we every day experience. You know the whale is a horrific danger to you, that you would be powerless against the force it represents, and at the same time, being able to observe it in all its great vastness from your boat? What an incredible experience, like nothing else in the world. I find this interesting because it sort of paints a spectrum of emotions. On the one hand, we have terror, on the other, we have pleasure, and presumably, between the two, we have something unaffected and neutral. We already get cosmic horror, that's the terror side of this. The whale could end your life without noticing it. You are a grain of sand in the desert of deep time. You are cosmically insignificant and unfit to fathom everything you see. That's one possible reaction to encountering the sublime. Then, toward the middle of our spectrum, you might feel not a sense of cosmic horror, but a sense of cosmic indifference. So what if you're that vulnerable to this massive sea creature? Why does the scale of your life against the scale of deep time even matter? Who said the cosmos has to care or that you have to understand it? When confronted with the sublime, it isn't unreasonable for your emotions to simply shut off. It might even be a good coping mechanism to prevent you from spiraling off into an existential episode. A way to acknowledge, but not succumb to, the sublime. And then we get to the far end of the spectrum. Beyond cosmic horror, beyond cosmic indifference, if you are lucky, you may have the opportunity to experience cosmic bliss. We all know about H.P. Lovecraft and his brand of horror, but while he was working on giving us nightmares, one of his friends was busy exploring a more hopeful side of this fiction. In the story The City of the Singing Flame by Clark Ashton Smith, the famous writer Giles Angarth finds his way into a realm unlike any on Earth. A place carpeted with violet grass, bathed in the glow of a sunless amber sky, and permeated through with music. The music seems to glide on the air itself, beckoning to him. And of course, he follows. In a dreamlike trance, he wanders through a beautiful city of benevolent, statue-like giants, into a vast temple at the city's heart, and at last to the song's source, a fountain of radiant green flame suspended above a pit. And around it are gathered countless visitors like him, improbable creatures of every possible description, pilgrims from who knows what strange dimensions. Enthralled by the music, many of them begin to hurl themselves into the fire. Angarth himself begins to feel the same compulsion and leaves before it can drive him to self-immolation. But before long, the allure of the flame and its beautiful song become too powerful in his mind, and he finds that he can think of little else. He can't even write fiction anymore, which is his entire career. So he returns, but decides to bring his illustrator friend with him this time. And when his friend, confronted by the beauty of the flame and its song, gives in to the compulsion and throws himself into the flame, Angarth soon decides that he wishes for the same rapture. As he describes it, the flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. He cannot return home, cannot even make his art anymore. He has witnessed the sublime, bewitching glory of the singing flame and will only be satisfied when he too has joined it. If you think about it, this story is strikingly similar to The Nameless City. An explorer in a strange place finds himself face to face with the sublime. Both the radiant void of the nameless city and the singing flame offer the same dangers. They both threaten the existence of anyone who enters them, the sanity of anyone who observes them, and the self-concept of anyone who experiences them. But you'll notice, the framing is very different. In one of the stories, all of these are indeed interpreted as threats, but in the other, they're interpreted almost as gifts. Instead of existential dread at the prospect of ceasing to exist, the singing flame offers something almost merciful. Dissolution not as death, 
but as a release from this ongoing existential crisis called life. A beautiful, musical, compassionate exit alongside so many others. It's probably a little hard to wrap your head around because, of course, you want to keep living. Human biology screams against the idea of death, so it's weird to see it made even a little bit desirable. The book Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer approaches this in a really interesting way. Early in the story, the main character inhales a spore from a strange fungus. As it grows within her, it gradually shifts from being described as an infection to something far stranger. A sort of brightness gradually overtaking her. She can feel herself changing, the person she was gradually receding. And it feels good, like a release from so many of her problems. Near the story's end, a dying character even describes her as, quote, a slow burning flame, a will o' the wisp, floating across the marsh and the dunes, floating and floating, like nothing human, but something free and floating. Just like all those pilgrims in the temple, like Angarth's friend, like Angarth himself in the end, this woman is consumed, gone. And it's kind of wonderful for her. Instead of madness at the prospect of one's concept of reality being upended, the singing flame offers liberation from the confines of a hitherto limited and banal existence. In the first book of the Angelarium series by Peter Morbacher, a man ascends into the abstracted, heavenly realm of the divine, where he confronts the world tree. It is all things. Every piece of reality, every life that ever was, is contained within the lines of its bark, the twisting of its branches. Anxious about the earthly life he left behind, he tries to see the lives of his mortal family in the bark, but it's overwhelming and he falls into despair. At this, Raziel, the Angel of Mysteries, says to him, Do not seek to understand. Simply stand witness. Just as the flame offers freedom from preconceptions of the value of life and individuality to Angarth, now this man, standing amidst the divine, is offered the opportunity to let go and allow the truth to wash over him whether he can make sense of it or not. Instead of cosmic insignificance at the prospect of your tiny life against the immensity of all time and existence, the singing flame offers exaltation. The opportunity, if only for a beautiful transitory moment, to be part of the sublime, rather than just its observer. The story In the Hills the Cities by Clive Barker is perhaps my favorite example of this in fiction. We even did an entire video on it last year. The short version is that, after discovering that an entire town of people has managed to turn itself into a wayward colossus of human bodies, one of the main characters chases the giant down in a frenzy and climbs onto it to become a part of it. Although the giant is doomed to die, and there is no way this character will survive the journey, he feels he has no other choice. Quote, Anything to catch this passing miracle and be a part of it. Better to go with it wherever it was going, serve its purpose, whatever that might be. Better to die with it than live without it. Sounds eerily similar to what Angarth said, doesn't it? How, in the end, he longed for that flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. So, if you're not afraid of cosmic horror, that's okay. You don't really have to be for it to be effective. Although the sublime is, as Burke said, fundamentally terrifying, that terror can also be the foundation for other powerful emotions. Maybe when you encounter these ineffable things, larger than life, larger than your mind's ability to properly fathom, instead of responding with fear or pushing it out of your brain entirely, you can allow yourself to experience something transcendent. A thrill at the possibility of release. A sudden longing for liberation. A real chance at exaltation. Maybe, next time you confront the sublime, instead of cosmic horror, you could be feeling cosmic bliss. When I was picking videos for this list, I was careful to choose the ones that I really felt had an impact on me. Fiction has so much actionable power. It is art, yes. But as Neil Gaiman says, it's also the lie that tells the truth. There is so much you can learn from stories, 
and I feel lucky to be in a place to share that with you. Interestingly, education outside of fiction has a way of amplifying its effect. Knowing how the world really works, your maths, sciences, logic, will help the truths in these stories click into place in ways that you can't possibly predict. Unfortunately, getting a formal education that way is prohibitively expensive, and the classroom really isn't a one-size-fits-all option. But our lovely sponsor, Brilliant.org, can make all of that far more affordable and far more fun than it's ever been before. Brilliant really has been helping me broaden my horizons. I can always go to the site, click into a class, pick up where I left off, and take in a bite-sized piece of the fundamentals I've been missing. Whether it's maths, science, physics, anything and everything STEM, Brilliant has something for you. Lately for me, it was Brilliant's Thinking in Code class, which I feel is oddly appropriate for me. I can really feel it just opening up a whole new world to me that I had almost no idea was there before. Slowly but surely, as I educate myself in this way, the AI revolution isn't looking quite so intimidating anymore. And to be perfectly honest, it doesn't even really feel like studying. A lot of what you do on Brilliant might be better classified as mini games. Look how interactive and fun these are. This one even has robots. Because Brilliant is so simple, moves at your pace, and starts at the very fundamentals, this is actually something that's really sticking for me. Almost like a personal tutor or coach. A legitimate, accessible, affordable, easy education, even for someone like me, with my head in the clouds and my face ever buried in fiction. And the best part? You can start for free. Visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry or click the link in the description to get your first 30 days for free. The first 200 Tail Foundry fans to sign up for a yearly subscription to Brilliant will get 20% off, so definitely hurry. Those slots are going to fill up fast. Again, visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry to get your first 30 days for free and 20% off a year subscription. Don't let something as simple as a lack of education hold you back. Try this out for free and be as brilliant as I know that you can be.